So I'm David Lowe. Um, by training, I am a wet lab, so-called hard sciences immunologist. I have that kind of training. And um, so I have had a lot less experience in humanities and social sciences, but don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are humanities and social sciences professors. So, however, because we are so reliant on experiment and belief and a fundamental belief in something called objective reality, um, that the issues of reproducibility, the issues of, uh, of data collection and things like that are um, sometimes a little bit uh, different from maybe the, the kind of work that you may be familiar with. In the early stages of my career doing the immunology work and things like that, the idea of what high impact research was, was related to like, oh, you know, we publish in Nature, we publish in Cell, those are considered high impact journals. I now work in a medical school in inland Southern California, where the stated mission of the medical school is to serve our communities and improve the health of our communities. So when you talk about things like research to action, we're talking about impact that actually has meaningful um, change in the outcomes of the lives of the communities we serve. And that means a lot of things that I'm gonna talk about today. So for example, um, I am also the director of the Center for Health Disparities Research and uh, at, at UC Riverside. And it is a broadly interdisciplinary center that has everything from you know, engineering and environmental sciences to again, you know, social sciences, cultural studies, um, things like that as well. So um, the question of what counts in health disparities research is going to is going to matter depending on your your perspectives and how you approach uh, these questions. So today I'm going to talk about really broadly two sorts of issues that are of impact and have really meaning in terms of the work that we're doing. One is that when we think about what is considered by definition health disparities research, um, what are the deficiencies in the way the research is done, the views of what counts as data, what counts as, again, our, again as, a, as a wet lab scientist, the fundamental belief in something called objective reality. Um, what counts and how um, can many different approaches to health disparities research miss the real action. The, Corollary to that is that if the missing the real action means um, understanding where health disparities really are in communities, it means working with communities rather than downloading data sets. And so I'm going to talk about that as well, because this is where the research to action makes a difference. Whether I'm testifying in front of the state legislature, whether I'm meeting with our local congressmen and in um, inducing them to submit bills, um, let, uh, policy changes, um, directing government funding to projects that have meaningful impact on communities' lives. So um, I may be in the den of lions here, but <laughs> I'm gonna tell you uh, my perspectives on this. So it does relate to research transparency and reproducibility, but in a context that I hope to be able to share with you. And at the end, um, after I go through these two major, the, these two broad topics, I'm gonna to discuss a little bit of like the sorts of things that we have had to learn in developing our research program. And as I said, you know, I'm coming from the wet lab background and now I spend so much more time in communities, talking to families, talking to uh, community organizations and how important that is in actually doing research that's gonna have meaning. So as you are already familiar, health disparities research is generally often um, using data sets to identify areas where disparities in health, disparities in outcomes are revealed. And um, they can also extend to things like more 
um, qualitative studies, like, you know, interviewing people and saying, you know, oh, what do you think is going on? Um, you know, it's harder to get like statistical samples when you do that sort of thing. However, um, input from individuals from uh, interviews and things like that can be um, valuable too. Often health disparities research, as I have come to know it, um, is often describing differences in outcome, but without follow through. Like, what are you going to do about it, right? You know, it sucks to be you. Now, what are you going to do about it? That's the job of what we approach in our center. Now, the reason that matters is because when we look at the data sets that identify health disparities, are they structural uh, racism obstacles, whether they're explicit racism or in, um, unknown, like for example, um, in the academy, as we call it, right? Tenure is actually a racist construct, whether it's realized or not, because it entrenches um, access and privilege. And that is by outcomes, a racist construct, right? So it's all those kinds of things that we look at in terms of outcomes that aren't necessarily defined from the beginning as a disparity that is an intentional um, you know, uh, setup for those sorts of things. There are other things that are, whether it's intentional or not, are things like you know, people who live near freeways, live near um, chemical plants and, and refineries, those kinds of uh, aspects. The more challenging aspects relate to things like adverse experiences, whether it's adverse childhood events or the um, cumulative burden of racism, just knowing that if you are a person of color, you don't want to drive in the streets on your own in the middle of the night because you're more likely to be shot by the police than say I might be, although I may be a different color. But um, those kinds of burdens have cumulative kind of weathering effects. And you know, and we're not going to go into too much of that, but it is the idea that health disparities have so many contributing factors. And they are defined often by social determinants of health. And they are studied by a lot of different um, approaches, which we, again, we won't go into a lot of those details, but there, as I said, there is more obvious social determinants, well, socioeconomic status, for example, you can only afford to live in neighborhoods where it's, like I said, near the freeway, near the um, refi oil refineries and things like that. But there are also those things that have um, real serious impacts, but were not obvious. So I teach in a medical school and a lot of the things that have impacts have to do with the way, even the way we teach our medical students, right? So if medical students really don't respect the statements of patients of color, they people will be underdiagnosed and undertreated, right? So their intrinsic medical conditions or predispositions aren't their fault. It's the fault of the student who is poorly trained to not recognize that they need to listen. Um, when I was in medical school, we were taught about, you know, like predispositions to like multiple sclerosis, right? If you weren't a blonde Scandinavian woman, you don't have MS. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. Latinos, Hispanic actually have suffered from multiple sclerosis at the same rates. However, they are underdiagnosed and their outcomes are worse. So the fact that doctors are trained to say, well, you're a patient of color, you don't have MS, so you won't get treated for it, again, shows a failure in that system. I'm gonna talk about race normalization. I think I still have that slide in here, about how medical science, in an effort to basically make all the data look pretty, have actually imposed explicitly racist approaches to looking at patient data. So again, um, the whole approach I want to give you is that be skeptical. Be skeptical of the data, be skeptical of the approaches to looking at disparities and how you may be misled. Um, cultural factors. Um, you know that in many cultures, Asian cultures, Latino, things like that, even things like access to healthcare, um, especially mental health, are often subject to self-imposed 
um, inhibitions because of stigma and things like that. So again, disparities in care and outcomes may not necessarily be imposed by explicit racist attitudes, but could be even self-imposed by cultural differences. This is from a, a lecture I've been giving, uh, a lecture on um, rheumatology. And all the time we, you know, we're teaching our medical students, we were showing images of dermatology lesions basically on white people, all right? Now, in our communities at least, half or more of our patients are not white. And so the lesions that they're going to see need to reflect the patient um, actual diseases. And so now what we have here is that, yes, the patient on the left with lupus has a classic malar rash that we have taught for decades. But if you look at patients on the right, patients of color, the appearance of lupus lesions are completely different. This is true for other rheumatologic diseases, but it's also true, especially for the whole range of dermatologic uh, lesions as well. And because we have not been teaching our students that the outcomes of the patients we treat are gonna be affected by that. Race normalization, another really scary thing when you think about this. Okay, we like to think of data as nice and clean, curated and so on. Well, medical science doesn't like messy data. And they didn't like the fact that whenever you did things like cardiovascular pulmonary uh, data sets, and you looked at white versus black patients, the curves didn't match. And so what do you do? You say, well, pulmonary function in black people, especially women, for example, is worse than it is in white people. And it is a predictor of poor outcomes, uh, um, earlier deaths from cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. Well, they didn't like that, right? So what they do is they do race normalization. So they took the black curves and shifted them to match the white curves. Unfortunately, what that does is it destroys the predictability of that data in terms of medical outcomes, but it made the medical doctors happy that the curves matched. So when we look at medical data, we are looking at artificially imposed adjustment factors that are there to make the doctors happy, but are not there to serve the patient. So other aspects, um, trying to quantify the impacts of race is really challenging because we talked about the race normalization issue. We talked about underdiagnosis. We talk about um, some of the other um, under treatments, um, other uh, social and socioeconomic and other kinds of uh, geographic uh, disparities as well. But even things that are more difficult to define, like this notion of racial weathering, just like I said, just the idea that now it's, it's okay, not to, not to make this about myself, but now you see this increasingly about Asians as well, being uncomfortable, say, walking in downtown San Francisco, worrying that you're going to be stabbed, right? Um, white people don't have those same kinds of, of underlying fears and weathering that affect their everyday lives, right? So this is a very difficult thing to quantify. Um, and so those are the kinds of issues that need to ultimately be addressed in health disparities research. Okay, I'm gonna show a few examples of how the data is actually um, suspect. So for example, as you recall, we had a pandemic and um, COVID was described as having disproportionate impacts on people of color, black, you know, um, Latino and things like that. And everybody said, well, you know, the Asians are so much better off, right? They had so much better outcomes, right? Well, it turns out that it is only true if you are a rich East Asian person. If you are not, but they still considered you Asian, your outcomes from COVID were completely dramatically different. Except that we don't disaggregate the data to reflect those huge disparities. Another thing I'm gonna get into much more detail uh, later on is this notion that 
how we study communities and how we gather data is very much dependent on the fact that these are human beings and who consents to participate in these studies matters quite a lot. So in the black community, uh, if you know any history at all, you will know why they are suspicious of participating in any medical studies. The Tuskegee experiments, I mean, there's a whole, you know, um, forced sterilization. I mean, you know, goodness knows how many things there are. And so if the black data, it, the, the data on black communities and black patients needs to be taken as really healthy, skeptical views because you don't know who's actually participating in those studies because many of them are basically, there's no way I'm giving my information to the government. Latino communities, similarly, um, a lot of immigrant com communities, same deal. Uh, you know, they come from, um, you know, authoritarian or fascist governments or, or China, whatever we call that, where you know the government is into everything, right? So the last thing you want to do, you come here and you think, oh, I'm in America, the government is trustworthy, right? <laughs> so these are all the issues we have to deal with. So I'm going to talk about um, the outcomes in COVID, for example, among Asian communities. If you look at the curves here, this is disaggregated data. If you just look at Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander aggregated data, it looks as if that, you know, they're doing kind of okay. But if you're looking at um, death rates among Pacific Islander communities, it's dramatically different here, all right? If you look at all Asians, it's actually pretty happy, right? Asian and HPI. But if you are among some of these communities, the uh, death rates are dramatically different because there are 60 to 80 different Asian communities. And if you don't disaggregate the data, you're missing the real story, okay? All right, now, so this is an issue. Again, back to the ideas like, is there such a thing as objective reality? Um, we think that if we're doing studies on communities, that by doing the observations and actually engaging and interacting with communities to improve our data quality, are we changing the data? Well, the answer is, well, yes, but <laughs> for a good reason, okay? So the idea is that an honest, trusting relationship with the community actually will give you insights that you may otherwise miss from looking at aggregate data. So in California, for example, there is a um, um, health assessment survey. Um, the, one of them is run out of UCLA. And it basically covers like, you know, countywide health assessment data. Well, I'll tell you from a point of view of the kind of work that we're doing in our communities, it completely sucks. It is so shallow. It does not separate communities. It is lacking a lot of geographic details because, for example, the rich white people living in Palm Springs are lumped in with the poor agriculture, immigrant Mexican communities in India, right? So how is that accurate information, right? So the idea is that we have to actually address these kinds of differences by working with communities so we know who it is we're studying and that we have a relationship where they will give us honest input, honest data. So that's why we talk about this as research with, not on communities, because they need to be active partners in the research we're doing. Give you a brief case study. In, uh, we're studying um, health in the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea, as you can see in the picture here, at the southern end, it is a multi-billion dollar agriculture industry. So all your winter salads are coming from the Salton Sea. Those workers are 90 some percent immigrant Mexican. Half of them are undocumented without health insurance, okay? Um, and as I said, on the other end of the Salton Sea, you have Palm Springs, Palm Desert, gated communities, golf courses, dumping a million gallons of water a night on those golf courses. That's the kind of differences we're seeing. 
Um, this example is we're studying asthma in the eastern Coachella Valley. Now we know that because the Salton Sea is an inland terminal lake that's drying up because of climate change, sorry, um, decreasing freshwater inputs, the exposure of the lake bed around it is causing a lot more dust to be produced. And the high particulate matter in the air is connected to the high incidence of asthma, especially among the immigrant families and their children because they can only afford to live in the unlicensed trailer parks close to the Salton Sea, whereas the rich white people in Palm Desert and Palm Springs are considerably far further away and the wind is going in the other direction. So the problem, as I mentioned, is that the epidemiology data you can see here is by zip code, right? And that is not really defining communities even if you look at census tracts, it doesn't necessarily give us the, the, the granularity that we need to understand those disparities within geographical areas. So how did we get into this? Well, we had been, I had been introduced to families in Eastern Conchella Valley con concerned about a high incidence of childhood asthma and the problem being that nobody has been studying it. And partly because when people have looked at the public health data, it looks like no problem, right? Yeah, there's a slightly increased incidence of asthma, but, you know, it's same if you live near, you know, in, if you live in the Central Valley. Unfortunately, um, nobody's really done the detailed study to separate out the communities living close to the Salton Sea versus the rich gated communities that are further away. So how do we do that? So the other problem, again, because I work in a medical school, talking to physicians, pediatricians, asthma is actually a difficult thing because kids are notoriously uncooperative. And so if you're trying to do a real fair diagnosis and workup of a kid coming in wheezing and coughing, your instinct as a pediatrician is not to do a spirometry workup or do lab tests or things like that. No, here's an inhaler, go away, all right? and they don't do follow-up, they don't ask whether or not it helps. That's a problem because not, what we found in our research is that not all asthma is the same and the dust being produced at the Salton Sea is causing a higher incidence of asthma for reasons that are not trivial. And so that's why um, having actual connection with the community, actually then digging in and doing the actual wet lab, you know, um, uh, scientific studies gives us insights into the issues um, that we otherwise would have not bothered to ask about. Now, part of that has been establishing community advisory boards. So we now have regular meetings with families, community advisory boards drawn from the community. Uh, I do a lot of work with community organizations that are advocates for the communities and things like that. I'm telling you, it's a completely different world because normally I was just in my lab, the MD stands for mouse doctor, you know? So <laughs> it's a very different world, I can tell you. So the uh, community advisory board, they, these are families, you know, most of them have asthma or have kids with asthma or both. Um, they are concerned, they are trying to reach out to their legislators, assembly members, congressmen, and things like that. But guess what? If they're often undocumented, poor, what kind of voice do they have in government, right? Like zero. Um, and so when I have a chance to speak with an assembly member, go to Sacramento, testify, um, I represent a school of medicine, the University of California, um, it has a diff it, it falls differently, right? So being able to work with them, learn what they know from them and be able to basically communicate this information is again, this kind of like research to action that I've never had experience with before. So it's really a, in, in some ways, it's kind of like a, a heady sort of thing because this is impact I never imagined we could have. So now we're doing things like we're doing community studies surveying symptom-based questions about kids in the community. We're also, as I said, we're also doing lab studies on what actually is in the dust and how it's causing um, inflammatory disease in the lung and things like that. And, and so um, it's really completely um, had an impact in these communities. 
And I'll tell you why the other part, the, the, the other corresponding part of it is not just us going in there and gathering samples and gathering data, it's also working with the community. So qualitative data is still valuable in the sense that it gives us insights into what are the priority issues in those communities. If I just said, well, you know, I'm really interested in prostate cancer, right, in Latino communities, and they say, we, that's like so far down our list. Why are you wasting government money on that, right? These are the kinds of things we gain from having community advisory boards, partnerships with the community organizations. So we see that the families talk about allergies, asthma, and things like that, yet nobody's actually done a workup. Are these allergic diseases? Are these immune uh, problems and things like that? We are now getting funding. We are now getting involvement with communities to be able to do these kinds of studies. So for example, we found that the symptoms they described for childhood asthma are not your classic suburban kid's asthma. When they occur, when, what makes it better? When does it go away? For example, one of the things that's associated in these communities is nosebleeds. That is not true in suburban America. So we have now evidence that there's actually a biological reason that the dust is actually causing inflammation in the nasal passage. And the kids, of course, pick their nose and of course they bleed. But it is actually leading us to actual hard science studies on what the biological medical um, phenomena are. Um, the families also work with us in saying, look, you want to collect your samples here because these are the communities being affected. If I just randomly drove down to the Salton Sea, which I initially did, <laughs> and collected samples, we would be missing whole communities, right? So these are really important parts of these kind of partnerships. Now, the, turn, the other side of this is working with the communities. And so we are also actively engaged in dissemination so that not only do we want them to understand what we are doing because of what they you know, told us and highlighted for us, but also how we can empower the communities to be more effective advocates on their own behalf. So for example, um, we worked with a California Air Resources Board, you know, CARB, Thanks to them, all of our air is cleaner and our vehicles are cleaner, right? So they are now turning their attention to environmental hazards. And so we were, were working with them and doing a series of community forum events where we take, we've, we've gathered a bunch of researchers and other advocates for communities and given presentations in these meetings to the community to give them a little bit more reliable, verifiable information on what's going on in their community, what's going on in their environment, what are people doing about it, what are the medical conditions, and what are the actual implications. So I don't know if any of you have asthma, but asthma is one of these chronic inflammatory diseases that for the most part, medically, we can only manage it. There is no cure, right? We can manage it. You know, you have your inhaler and things like that. So when you have potentially up to 30% of your kids with asthma, that's serious, right? Not only because of their ability to you know, learn in schools, to actually work and maintain jobs, um, and the burden on the families that they have to stay home with their kids, things like that. There's all kinds of um, issues here, and we want to be able to work with communities as well as give them the as I said, the information so that they can then go to their assembly member, they can go to their congressman and say, you know, this is going on, what are you gonna do about it? And the state has spent hundreds of millions of dollars mainly working to restore habitats for migratory birds, right? So I had a meeting with um, Salton Sea Authority um, and they're all trying to do these mitigation projects and things like that. I said, well, do you have any plans to look at the effects on the health in the community? And the answer was, well, why would we wanna do that? Um, now it's changed. Now the new director of Salt and Sea Authority, he's now like all about health impacts, right? So things have changed. And I think part of it is because communities understand the importance of being active and having good information. Um, so as you can see from this, we've had huge response from communities and organizations, congressmen, um, and, and, and things like that, where now like a lot more people know that, look, we get together, we can have an impact, right? 
and it's data driven. But as I started in the very beginning, what data, right? So part of the issue is data that we generate, data that matters. And now our next step is training community, um, community health workers to actually become community scholars so they can lead projects. They have the tools, bring them onto campus, give them help to you know, teach them in methods, social science methods, um, research methods and things like that. So the idea is that um, being able, just being able to bring in funding and research projects is that if the community members can lead them, then there's even greater potential for impact. So uh, as I said, the, the um, issue is to, to um, highlight these things. So I just wanted to show you this because this was really a fun thing. I'm actually now working with a, a comic book artist to work on a graphic novel on climate change and the Salton Sea. So this is so totally out of my background, but it's really cool. So we started doing publishing a series of comics. We had some very talented uh, artists, and we actually um, looked, at, you know, looked at a couple of project ideas on like how do we communicate these issues of air quality and health in the community in a ways that explains not to six-year-olds, but actually to families, right? How do we how do we address that? So we've cut, tested a couple of narrative styles and things like that. Any of you remember, you know, Hungry, Hungry Caterpillar and the Very Hungry Caterpillar and stuff like that? This artist just captured that style really well. And so um, we have these, these comics where he basically, all the parts of the lung have personalities and when they're choking and things like that, oh, you know, those kinds of, um, ways of conveying what's happening in the lung, um, as well as the toxicity of the dust. You know, how do you convey that visually? And so this is really has been really valuable because even though we publish both in English and in Spanish, it doesn't require language to explain what's going on. So really a huge, huge fun thing. So of course, picture my lab. <laughs> um, and so, as I said, we're working on a new uh, a graphic novel, and we're hoping we can get more uh, wider distribution uh, of that. But the idea, again, is communicating and helping communities. Now, because we're talking about climate change more broadly, it's not just limited to salt and sea communities. As you know, the Great Salt Lake in Utah is drying up, and the inc incidence of asthma is increasing there. If anybody, you know, Owens Valley um, and Mono Lake, the highest admission rate for asthma in the state in, are in Mono, in Mono County, near Mono Lake. That's an, another terminal lake with lots of dust, all right? So these are important and these are happening all over, across the country and all around the world. So um, we, just a, a brief look at, at what, how, how we've actually done this. As I said, the incidence of asthma and where the families live suggested to us it wasn't your conventional allergic disease, you know, like kids going out to play, they're allergic to the grasses and the pollen and they come out in wheezing. It looks like the Salton Sea ecosystem itself, and that's why I'm talking about climate change, the Salton Sea ecosystem, Salton Sea was formed 100 years ago when the irrigation canal broke and the Colorado River just poured into a dry salt basin. Over decades, the, it went from fresh water to now being twice as salty as the Pacific Ocean, which had huge changes in the ecosystem. And because of the drying um, lake, it has um, also exposed a lot of the lake bed and produced a lot more of the dust. And so the people who are showing the most severe asthma symptoms are those people who live closest to the Salton Sea. And they tell me, you know, like they go visit family in Mexico, the kids' symptoms go away. Right, so that's different. <laughs> something is different. So something associated with living there and breathing the dust while, while you're there. So we actually did studies where we worked with communities that say you got to collect samples here and there. We took dust samples from around the Salton Sea. You can see it's in inland Southern California, and we actually then did lab studies where we exposed mice to aerosols generated from our dust collection. And we found that the mice had potent inflammatory responses to our surprise, but also to our surprise, it was not allergic. Now, again, if any of you have asthma, normally you associate asthma with allergies. What we saw here is not allergic. 
So it means that we're talking about a completely different mechanism of lung disease. And so that's important because it may mean different therapeutic approaches, different ways to diagnose and treat kids in that community. So again, how does the research lead to actionable um, approaches? So the, all of this became because we were working with families, working with communities, getting that information, leading us to the lab studies. Um, and because we give the information back to the families, they can now go to their legislators, they can go to the state agencies and say, these are things we want you to do because now when they have data to back it up, um, these agencies and legislatures and things like that are better uh, likely to listen. So for example, just a few weeks ago, the local assembly member submitted bill, assembly bill 827 to actually fund for the first time a serious epidemiology study in the Salton Sea region. So we will actually have legitimate data on the incidence of pulmonary disease in that community, right? So even if it's only data collection, it is a far cry from what we've been working with in the past. So we are starting to see change in that. Now, I wanted to go to the, the um, aspect that made this all possible and why it's uh, important to continue to work in this way is that um, inland Southern California is, except for the rich areas, is largely, like I said, immigrant Mexican, that sort of thing. This is true in other parts of the country as well, where many communities are being studied by health disparities researchers. And the reason they've always been skeptical of these fancy ivory tower academics is because there's this phenomenon that's referred to as helicoptering, right? So the fancy coastal elite schools come in, collect samples, you know, from the community, they go back to their, their, their offices and write papers and the community never hears about it. They never see the papers, they never have feedback, they never learned what was learned by those um, researchers. And so that history is so um, entrenched in academia that those communities have a, built a real kind of skepticism and um, suspicion of academics coming in and wanting to do research with communities. How do we address that? Um, as I mentioned before, they also have had to, you know, um, remember, you know, generations of abuse from, you know, the authority, whether it's government, whether it's, you know, uh, other, other kinds of things where, you know, exploitation, abuse, and things like that. So then how do we do that? How do you go in and establish trust with the community? So for a couple of reasons, one is to get better quality data, to establish working relationships so they can give you some insights into what are the real priority issues in these communities. These are people who live these lives. And so the issues that are priority of them should be your priorities as well. So how do we do that? So um, we can sort of do a workshop. I, you know, I, I hate breakout sessions and I'm, so you'll never catch me doing stuff like that, right? But the things to think about are how do existing social and cultural relationships within communities as well as between the academy and the communities um, exist? How can they change? How do you do that, right? So UC Riverside is in inland Southern California, but even so, it is still in many ways acting like your classic ivory tower institution. Even though it has the most diverse undergraduate population, I guess, I, I guess there may be some other, I think Irvine might have a really diverse population as well, but um, you know, 40% of the students are Hispanic, Latino, 20% are Asian, you know, um, and largely from the community. So it's incredibly diverse. But the faculty is like 90 some percent white, right? So it's again, classic um, ivory tower sort of thing. So how do we change that? Um, our medical school was created because of real um, um, enthusiastic advocacy from the community that we need a medical school in inland California, right? I mean, Davis is another one in inland California, but the rest are 
you know, you can throw a pebble into the ocean from the other institution. Um, how we have conversations with communities matters too. In academia, it's a, it's really, a, a, I'm trying to figure out how to, to address this. If you're into the academy, they always talk about Latinx, all right? You know, you know the term Latinx for communities, right? I have never once heard a Latino person in inland Southern California use that term, all right? So what are we doing, right? Um, these, it's not just terminology, it's language barriers, right? How many, so at least many of our researchers speak Spanish and that's important. Although many of the communities speak Purupucha, right? It's not even Spanish, right? So how do we do that? We have a network of uh, promotoras, community health workers that speak the language, they help us communicate. Uh, and the related thing is that how do we recognize their participation and contributions to our research studies? And that's another area where the whole academy thing breaks down because the University of California rules, I don't know if any of you are in the UC system, the rules for payments is Byzantine and uh, it's just ridiculous. So when we are trying to pay our permitoras for work that they've done in communities on our behalf, they are often waiting six months or more to get that, that money, right? They, um, they are happy to allow direct deposit. Now, how many people in inland Southern California, Mexican immigrants, do you think have bank accounts, right? It's just totally not recognizing the value of the community and our partnership and, uh, and how we work with them. The last thing here is how do we maintain and sustain relationships? So for example, as we've done with these, um, these um, community forum events where we communicate the research and addressing issues, I mean, lithium, as you may have heard, lithium is a big story in, in the Salton Sea where now they think there's trillions of dollars in lithium that only need to be extracted from you know, the brines in, in the Salton Sea. Well, of course, the people who are doing that are the you know, multi-billion dollar corporations who are not from this state. So you can imagine what the communities immediately are wondering is like, so you're gonna come in, extract trillions of dollars and we get zero, right? So there, there are those kinds of issues. How do you inform communities? They're worried like, is this gonna now poison our environment at worse than it already is and we get nothing to show for it? How do you empower them and train them to be advocates effectively in situations like that. So um, anyway, so that's, so that's um, the things I, I wanted to uh, raise with you again, to review, be skeptical of the data. How is it gathered? Who is it, who's gathering it? What are you using that data for? Is it only to make you happy? Um, and the idea that impact I view now, as I said, my, my, my life has changed. I view impact in a different way. It's not long, it's no longer whether I'm publishing in nature, I still wanna publish in nature. Um, but impact now has a different meaning because you see the kinds of reactions from families when like, you see me, you hear me, and you can maybe save my kid's life, right? So um, I'll leave it there. And I think I've made my point. <laughs> so um, I can take questions at this time.